Welcome, welcome to the Veterans Who Build show. Today's guest has one of the most inspirational stories that I've ever heard, and I'm sure you all will agree, from a very rough childhood upbringing to being diagnosed as on the spectrum, not allowing any of, the, any of these life hardships to define who he has become, a six and a half year Air Force, Space Force veteran, now co-founder of MyPaintBuckets.com. I am very excited for y'all to be inspired to learn from today's guests. A quick shout out to our subscribers. Thank you. A reminder to please subscribe to our channels, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. Quick shout out to our sponsor, Jet.Build. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome Joseph Tatio. Thank you to our channel sponsors, JetBuild. If you're looking for ways to better manage your real estate development and construction projects, look no further. Jet is the command center software for end-to-end -end real estate development and construction management. That's www.jet.build. Welcome, welcome to the Veterans Who Build show. I am very excited for today's conversation. Joe, thanks so much, man, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Appreciate being here, Adam. Where, where are you calling in from? Where, where are you located? Oh, I'm in Indiana now. As you can see, I've, I've tried to make it a, a very my own space. And you can probably guess I have hobbies um, <laughs> of various different kinds <laughs> just yeah. from looking behind me. Well, we'll uh, hopefully uh, get into some of those. Um, you know, I wanted to also highlight, give a shout out to uh, – uh, your business partner, Chris, who was on the show and uh, connected us so that you could also join the show. So I uh, appreciate that. Yeah. Chris and I served together for mm. many years, and then we, we ended up uh, reconnecting after I eventually got out of the force. So. That's awesome. That's awesome. So so quick uh, formal introduction, and then we'll kick off with the show. Joseph Latillo is a six and a half year Air Force Space Command veteran before it became Space Force. Joseph is an operations and technology development leader and founder of Date Palm Media and co-founder of My Paint Buckets, technology software management platform for paint contractors. Uh, Joseph, as the audience knows, uh, we like to start in chronological order. So uh, let's kick it off with uh, where you're from and you know what encouraged you, what made you interested in uh, joining the military. Okay. So as I told you before, you hit record. Hey. I always have been asked if I was a military brat because I lived everywhere mm. growing up, uh, including other countries. So basically, I hopped around the United States uh, between the Midwest and the, the West Coast. And then I've, I've experienced a lot of different lifestyles. So basically, I lived in Guatemala. And in Guatemala, we were rich. We had maids. I was also in the middle of the Civil War. and saw a lot of pretty messed up stuff growing up uh but but when i was in the u.s before i moved out there i was homeless living in a in a national forest right so the transition between being homeless in the national forest in utah and then living in guatemala and having two maids was very weird then moved back to the united states go through high school jump around a bunch and i just did not have a very stable home life growing up mm -hmm. and i was trying to put myself through college after i got out of high school and just realized it was going to take forever to to finish it cash flowing it myself mm -hmm. and like i i really hadn't had an interest in the military but i realized because of the way my personality was that it was going to really suck to be in the military, but that I needed it. If that mm -hmm. makes sense. Right. Like I, I needed a crucible to help me learn to shut up basically and to actually experience things. And of course, here I am on a podcast. I never really learned how to shut up, <laughs> but, but I did, get some of the core fundamental tools. Leadership has always been really, really important to me. So I felt like on top of needing to get college done and get more skills under my belt, that I'd be able to learn more about being a good leader by joining the military. As you um, were, were bouncing around in childhood and having those you know, very different experiences, that's 
certainly different extremes, as you put it, right? Um, U.S. In, in, in parks, homeless, and then Guatemala and, you know, with, with maids. Do you feel that that had impact on you as, as, as a kid, as an adult, looking back in hindsight? It's had a lot of impact on me in general. It's it's also kind of like it lets you see the world through a different lens mm. when you've lived in all those different extremes. Mm-hmm. Part of that makes it kind of frustrating to deal with me because I know when something's BS a lot faster than a lot of other people. Mm-hmm. So particularly being enlisted in the military and being able to see when something's just silly was very frustrating to the people who are trying to tell me to do something right and i and i joined the military a little later than other people a lot of people joined 17 18 i was like 19 or 20 when i went Mm -hmm. in um but i'd been living on my own since i was 14 Mm -hmm. so you go you go into the military and and basic training is like a crucible experience where they break you down and build you back up. And normally they don't have to break you down as much as they did with me because I was already very, very independent. Having lived on my own for six years by that point, Mm -hmm. it was different than most of the other people. And I saw a similar struggle with people who joined in their like late twenties or their thirties as well. Right. Like when you have to go through that experience as an older individual, it's just, it's harder because everyone gets treated the same. There's no special treatment. And it, at, like most of us in our mid twenties can wipe our own butts. Right? Like the, but, but you've got this level set that's at a lot lower skill level that you have to abide by until you've moved up the chain a bit. Yeah. And so that was something that was really challenging for me because I've always been a really independent individual, but it was really important for me to also learn to respect other people and to, to like be able to sit and watch and listen in a different way. Right. Sure. Something that didn't always have to be central to me being at the middle of everything, even though that is like, as someone who works independently, everything that is something I naturally am good at. I'm good at leading groups um, and, and being in charge, but experiencing being on the inside of a process, being at the Lotus point and building through it really helps you have a better perspective on all the other personalities that you're working with and the different things that people are doing, right? Like Mm -hmm. something that's frequently said in the military is that you need to be able to follow before you can lead. And that's certainly something that, that I've heard quite a bit along with some less pleasant things. But that's that one actually was a valuable lesson learned in the military. Mm. Well, before we, uh, that, that that was all great, great insight. And I, I think a lot of people in the military immediately could recognize what you're saying in terms of if you start at a later age than you know your 17, 18 year old, uh, there's a different you know breakdown process. Uh, simply, yeah. you know, exactly as you put it, right, because you've already had some independence. Uh, but before yeah. we get ahead of ourselves there, let's talk. Let's you know go back to kind of where we let off, where you let off. Um, so it sounds like you started university uh, and in that process, you realized, uh, you know, military was was a proper path or, or desirable path for you. Yeah, basically. I uh, mm-hmm. And I specifically have always had a very strong interest in working in space technology. Mm-hmm. So basically my joining the military was contingent on getting into space command at the time. It took a little bit longer for that. I think it added like six months for me to be stubborn and say like, no, nope, it's, it's space command or bust. I basically said, yeah, I, you're putting me in software or you're putting me in space command. <laughs> and so eventually I got into space command and, you know, honestly, now that I'm older and have gone through it, I probably would have been even happier in civil engineering, but I didn't even know that was a thing. Right. But yeah, something to keep in mind about the way space command worked, at least then. And I think it still is. It's very top heavy. So there's a lot more officer to enlisted ratio, which as someone who's kind of a more natural leader is really challenging. Hmm. Because they have a high saturation of leadership and they don't have a lot of new people coming in at the lower ranks, which which just kind of at the time, at least that was the way it was. And that meant that I it a lot of times it would be like 
you've got a captain in charge of a lieutenant in charge of a butter bar and the butter bar is in charge of like a master sergeant or something crazy like that. Right. And then the master sergeant is in charge of a tech sergeant and all the way down the line. Like everyone's got one mm -hmm. person they're in charge of. It's like, it's not the way you generally would structure because it's, it's like a line instead sure. of a pyramid. Right. And you just be like, okay, cool. But, um, well, let's, I, let's, yeah, let's yeah. before, before even uh, uh, yeah. you know, jumping to that point, let's, okay. let's, uh, first of all, out of curiosity, on uh, what were you studying in school? In I was studying, uh, software engineering. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, you know, I wanted to, to point out that, you know, even if perhaps civil engineering would have been a better track, at least you had a, you know, vision toward what you wanted to do. And I think that's worth, you know, being at least somewhat, you know, proud of, or, or just aware of that it, it's you know, relatively unique, at least you, you know, had your direction. So that's cool. So you were learning software engineering, uh, you enlisted to space command, walk us through that process. What was that like? Yeah. So, I mean, like, so when you enlist into a specific field, you have to take specialized testing to qualify for that specific field. You have to mm -hmm. sign the papers to say that if you fail that test, they'll just make you do whatever they want. So that was a little nerve wracking, right? right? And we were like, I said, well, I'm not joining unless you let me be space command. But I also signed a paper that said, if I screw up, you can make me do whatever you want. <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, I can only ask so much, right? And then, I mean, as someone who's on the spectrum and pretty fiercely independent, basic training was horrible. It was really bad. I had lots of people who loved it, but... I personally, I was actually physically attacked pretty regularly in basic training. Mm. I stood up out like a sore thumb and even things like me being a perfectionist and, and staying up and practicing marching, they would think that I was being punished and forced to do the extra practice. Therefore, they felt like they needed to punish me more. They didn't understand that I was actually taking initiative to improve right. my marching by marching around while I was doing dorm guard, right? It was like basic was definitely one of the areas in the military experience where I got the most PTSD out of anything else. Um, I've, I've dealt with real crazy situations in life, but being trapped in a room with 50 guys who openly talk in the bunk next to me about beating me up while I'm trying to sleep is like not pleasant. And that's something that sticks with you. It was, it was an important lesson, right? Because mm -hmm. I was like a hippie kid who just thought everything's love and rainbows and bloody. So that part of the experience taught me that, that there is a much darker side to human nature that I just like, even though I had seen it externally, I just had never experienced so much of it being directed at myself. Mm -hmm. So it made it a lot more real. Sure. Right. Sure. And so, yeah, once you got into tech school and it was focused on my like ability to think and solve problems, it became a lot better. Right. right. Like that's where I really shined. Like there was, there was two points in basic training where my personality shined. The part where we were outdoor, because I, I mean, like, like I said, I'd live homeless. Mm -hmm. I can catch fish with my bare hands. I'm, I have a lot of survival outdoor experience, which is part of the reason I thought I might do well in the military. It's like the idea of camping and bunks and eating spinach out of a can doesn't bother me at all. And then because of, of my, my background as a kid, I also did really well on the week where you're supposed to wear a suit and tie a tie. No one else could tie ties. Uh, there was like two or three guys in the whole dorm that could do it. So they all of a sudden changed their opinion on beating me up for a week while I taught them how to tie ties. Right. But like those skills translated a lot better into the, the higher level training and the further I progressed in the military, the, the more the more I was able to use those skills that actually the mm -hmm. real reason that I ended up eventually separating was just 
there wasn't enough opportunity for me to really be a leader in such a top heavy command. Sure. But yeah. But I'm so, getting ahead as I always do. So what's your next question? No, that's okay. I mean, first of all, thank you for, <laughs> for sharing all of that. It'll be interesting, you know, once we get to that transition period to hear kind of, you know, what, what that was like for you. But while we're still in the middle of service per se or beginning of yeah. service, talk, talk to us about, you know, what, what it was like, I guess, getting to first and foremost, getting to the, the unit that you served in. And then, you know, just whatever, just general, you know, I don't know, um, things that you remember, recall over your service and noting to our listeners that you had mentioned prior that, you know, a lot of it's still, uh, you know, cl classified, so you can't talk about it. That yeah. said, let's just, you know, touch on whatever of your service you, you can, you can talk about. Yeah. Yeah, I think like highlighting that point right there, there's mm -hmm. something that happens when you work in an environment, no, no matter whether or not it's the military or your work for Apple, where you're not allowed to talk about what you're doing. So you end up fixating a lot on your personal gripes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then one second, let me kind of make my lighting better real quick. Ah, yes, I can. There you go. Mm -hmm. ha -ha. All the pixels work now. Okay. So when you work in a corporate or a military environment and you're not allowed to talk to your friends or spouse about the things you do on a day-to-day -day basis, something that does happen is you tend to be like, I was working with Adam today and he forgot to do X, Y, or Z. And it's just like real nitpicky stuff where like he, sure. he was eating a really nasty smelling fish. I'm like, Never mind that Adam did like some amazing stuff and you like might have saved the world today. But the only thing you can talk about is, wow, it was a crazy day and Adam ate a smelly fish and it was really stinky. Um, so the issue there is if what you can talk about is superficial like that, mm -hmm. it does start to wear psychologically on your perspective sure. of the value of work that you do. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and I think that it's good advice for anyone in that circumstance to just kind of keep that in mind mm -hmm. that like, even if you can't talk about what you're doing for privacy reasons for your company or for the military, don't let that take away from the way you value yourself because you just can't outwardly express it. It's just something that sucks when you're working on something important enough. Sometimes you can't talk about it. Very but, well said. I, I think that's a really important point for, you know, people to hear in any, uh, you know, circumstance where exactly as you put it, right. You can't talk about your really your, your day-to-day -day purpose and therefore you yeah. get caught up on only what you can talk about, which exactly as you put it, yeah. some official stuff that wears yeah. on just your overall mindset R really well said. Yeah. No, yeah. You don't want to accidentally convince yourself that your life is just minutia mm -hmm. because there's, there's more to it than that. Mm -hmm. Um, now fundamentally some of the things with the, the work life balance that were challenging is things like, you know, doing 14 to 16 hour shifts mm -hmm. that can be really, really challenging <laughs> in the, in the military. But those times actually were some of the, my best memories in retrospect, because you get really close when you're working with a crew. And at least when you do have a mission that's really valuable and you know that you're doing something worth doing, that can be really significant. And the time that I spent in California, it was, it was really kind of foundational. I learned a lot about how to work with people, how to listen, how to lead. I found opportunities to work in technology while I was working in space command. And that really let me keep up with my, my fundamental skills that I use today. Right. Hmm. Cause at the end of the day, I was going to college for software before I joined the military. I wanted to do software or hardware in the military. I got to work in a high tech area mm -hmm. and then, and then any time there was an opportunity to volunteer to help with something that was at all remotely related to computers or technology, my hand was the first one to go up because I wanted to, I wanted to be contributing in the areas that I was strongest. Mm. Um, so correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong here, uh, you know, presuming just from the, the length of your service, you had uh, increased, right? Signed on for more time. So what, what led to, and again, you know, right. Just tell me if you, you signed yeah. on for six and a half up front. Uh, what, what led to you extending? Um, I was offered a 
basically i i needed to find a place where i could continue college i hmm. finished i finished my community college of the air force degree but that was a space technologies focus not an mm -hmm. engineering focus so i needed to either get out and transition to being a civilian contractor locally and have a long commute or find a place where I could continue my education while serving. And I got an opportunity to move to Colorado and there were two different engineering schools nearby. Mm -hmm. So I jumped on that. Just, I was coming up on the four year mark already mm -hmm. and they asked if I was willing to move and extend and I, I decided it was, it was worth it. So in, in that scenario, were you uh, both in school and you know, operating in your unit or it was just one, one, one at a time. Yeah. Yeah. It was both. full time military, mm -hmm. full time school for a while. Then I was full time military. And basically, as part of going to school, I realized that I wasn't going to get as much experience in the field as I needed. Mm -hmm. So that's when I started my first business. So I was still active duty military running an electronics business, developing robotics and doing part-time school at the same time. So it's a lot. <laughs> I, I did not sleep a lot during that course. Uh, and of course, just before moving from California to Colorado, I'd had my first kid. My wow. wife did the hard part. So yeah, it, it was really starting to wear me down by the, the end of, of my time, just trying to balance you know, going and doing PT, doing the full-time military, prepping for deployment type stuff, and trying to stay full-time school and run a business and be a parent mm -hmm. and, a, and a husband, right? Like these, these are all like at least part-time jobs. So yeah, yeah that, that was a pretty busy time in my life. Um, yeah, I'm sure. So I guess coming to the, the end of uh, your studies here in, in, in this time frame of your life, um, if there was anything, I guess, more you can touch on, uh, in terms of your service, then let's go there. If not, then, yeah. um, let's touch on that transition and we'll get into yeah. kind of these businesses that you were yeah. starting as well. No, I think, uh, one thing to keep in mind mm -hmm. for people who are wanting leadership opportunities in the military, special duty operations may not be the best for that. Cause then you end up with an even higher saturation of leader to follower uh, ratio. So that was ultimately one of the big things that kind of cut out that option because of the fact that th there just wasn't going to be an opportunity for another couple of years for me to be in charge sure. of anyone. Um, and at the time, that, that was one of the most important skills I really wanted to hone. Like I, I thought I'd be honing it within two years of joining the military from everything that was described to me. And at that point I was six years in and still had not had more than one direct report at a time, which for, for someone who had already like to take us back before I joined the military, I was already like a line manufacturing manager. I, I had worked at banks. I'd worked at all sorts of places. So when you've lived on your own since 14, you've had a lot of jobs mm -hmm. before, before you end up in the military. So the slow progression in that particular career field was a challenge. And the, um, but the, tr the transition to civilian life, like a big part of it also was because I had this misconception about the differences between corporate America and the military. So for, for someone who's, if, if the reason you're considering getting out of the military is you don't want someone to own your time and to fundamentally own you, corporate America isn't going to solve that either. So like, that's really important. Like if you're yeah. sitting here watching this and wondering if getting out of the military is for you, if your reasoning is that, then it's not a solution. And that's like the things that you may find frustrating in the military of being on call all the time, having to like report to an inept boss and having unreasonable expectations on like you figuring things out on your own without training and stuff. Some of those are actually worse in corporate America than they were in the military. Sure. Some, something the military does an amazing job of is training. Mm 
Mm. Like I cannot give enough props to the military organizations I've worked with for how well they do training and evaluations. And it's, it's actually an area that I worked on in the military that was really fulfilling, um, mm. teaching people different areas of expertise. Awesome. Um, but the, the thing that I have discovered after transitioning, so I, I, I went and I, while I was on terminal leave, became an electrical engineer. So I hadn't finished my college degree yet. I was still working on it, but it was like a five-year degree after having done the two-year degree. So basically I jumped in, was doing that work. It was really interesting. It was challenging, but it was a smaller corporation. So there was a little more flexibility and it was, it was very challenging trying to have that job while I was on terminal leave because the military kept on recalling me the whole time. Mm. So I got recalled from my terminal leave to do training for a potential deployment, right? Like, I, I everyone knew I wasn't going on the deployment, but they still, right. <laughs> geez, it was interesting, right? How long was that going on for? Oh, like the, the last three months or so, okay. at mm -hmm. least like six to, like three to six months of like, pretty weird transition mm -hmm. because I didn't, I didn't take vacation. That was mm -hmm. another big mistake that I did throughout the time I was in the military. It was sure. really, I, I've got a personality where I'm always on and mm -hmm. I, you know, I didn't give myself appropriate breaks and I didn't really learn to do that until much more recently, but it's really important. And a lot of people are great at it. I just wasn't, but yeah. So transitioning over to engineering work, then that company ended up bought out and you end up laid off from that. And then what I did after that was transition to like basically finish out college and moved out to Oregon to work for Dell. And that was probably one of the most amazing jobs I ever had. But when Dell was acquiring another software company, they decided to basically close out all of their software divisions. I don't know what their logic was. They were like, well, we're buying a company that just does software, so we should just get rid of our software and use theirs. It was very flawed. Right. Um, I, I, I'll let you know, the software I was working on was actually being used by the company we were acquiring. So in us <laughs> shutting down, we took away one of the products that had a synergy already. It was Weird. really funny. Yeah. So that whole group was cleared out. This whole time I'd been running my robotics company though. Mm -hmm. So part of the reason I was able to manage the transition a little bit was my robotics company had started to get decently successful until Amazon decided to hide the thing that says what country things come from. So if anyone who used to shop on Amazon like 10 years ago, they actually told you what country something was shipping from. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And this was before Prime was really a thing too. Like sure. they were just, they were just playing with the concept of Prime. So now everything is like either it's Prime or it's not. But as they started to transition in Prime, they just they totally stopped advertising that we were a U.S. manufacturer. And then these other countries, I won't name countries, but you can guess, were buying the parts that I was creating with my team and just copying them and selling them under my own listings. And so mm. over a three month period, we went from a really decent revenue to like well below the poverty line of, of potential income. So that's what had to transmission me into moving out to Oregon. What were these, uh, what was the robotics doing? And so it was mostly like STEM type stuff. I was one mm -hmm. of the early developers on Arduino and Raspberry Pi, mm -hmm. right? So I would create, I took the, the concept of the Arduino and created something called a Verselino that now only exists like on my shelf, but <laughs> fundamentally open source educational electronics. And um, we did that for years and years, but ultimately the part that I enjoy the most is the firmware, which is fundamentally software in a chip. 
Right. I'm really a fan of being able to test things and see if they work really quickly. Something that I don't enjoy in life is waiting six months to see if I screwed up. Fair enough. <laughs> right. Like that's fun. I'm not a very patient guy and I like to, I like to test things very quickly, do lots of iterations and have really collaborative mm -hmm. development in anything that I do. So I, I eventually just kept on getting software jobs. Mm -hmm. I worked for several other companies and, and each time they just, they would get acquired or they'd have massive layoffs. The, the mm -hmm. technology industry has like six months on six months off. So you basically, you get paid a lot. But then you get paid nothing for six right. months while you're looking. So that's something to keep in mind. And that's something that someone coming from the military is is definitely surprised by. Sure. Right? Mm -hmm. Like that is not the way the military works. The military will literally have you dig a hole if there's nothing to do. Right. Right? Like that's that's not I don't I don't like that extreme, but I do like that uh, in the military, if there wasn't a spot for you, they would find another AFC and put you in it, right? Yeah. That's that's a nice thing about it. They're going to find it. You'd be like, cool. Well, you can't do this anymore. Are you going to get out of the military or are you okay if we shuffle you over here? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's that's pretty nice. It's like you have to really try to get the boot in the military most of the time. And so in the in civilian sector, you could be the best developer they have, and that might be what gets you fired because you're intimidating. Sure. Um, and so, so before right. you know, before um, I mean, first of all, all, all great, all great points. Uh, you know, talking about those two different kind of extremes, right? In military, it's pretty much a very secure job. Uh, if you are in the tech space, right? I mean, fast pace, it's moving a lot. People are getting acquired, yeah, uh, ramping up, ramping down, etc. Per your story, right? For the examples yeah. you're, you're you're bringing to light, um, but before we you know continue on your professional career, um, I want to just give an opportunity to highlight kind of what advice you you'd give your younger self in that specific transition period from you know military to civilian. Um, I think one of the biggest things that I would have given my my old me advice on is rent the house, don't sell it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when I moved out of Colorado. That would have been a lot better plan. Sure. Um, the the other bit is just kind of like temper your expectations, right? Mm. Come in understanding that there are a lot of the things you don't like about the military still exist in the rest of corporate America and that you're going to still experience them. Mm -hmm. You do have the levity to quit, right? Right. You can quit, but that, that, that goes with you as right. well. They have the ability to ask, did they yeah. quit? <laughs> right. But most most people who come out of the military aren't really used to the idea of quitting. And, and it's also something to keep in mind that people are used to kind of abusing veterans. Right. Someone hires a veteran. They kind of know that you're most likely just going to deal with a lot of BS compared to your peers. And so I recommend negotiating higher than you think you should when it comes to pay, when you go out, if you do choose to jump into the rat race, um, because most likely you're going to have a lot of those same unpleasant experiences that you did in the military, as far as the way that you're treated, the kind of hours you're expected to do and that work-life balance. But, but no one is out there to bat for you, but you. That was the same advice I got in the military. I'm like you've got your advisors, right? But at the end of the day, the person who knows what you want in life and cares the most about you, it's probably you. Um, mm -hmm. And some of the best advice I got while in the military that ultimately is one of the reasons I decided to transition was that like the military isn't going to be there for you after you get out. It's right. your family. Mm -hmm. So if you burn all the bridges with your family to the ground while you're in the military and you don't have that support network before you get out, build a support network, make sure you're connecting with your friends and peers. And that like, that is something that transcends your career, mm -hmm. no matter what career you're in military or otherwise, mm -hmm. there's some, there's something that people don't really tend to talk about, which is basically 
when you leave the military or you leave a job, no matter how tight you were, like if me and Adam, we worked together for 10 years, that actually makes it worse. The fact that we worked together at the same place for 10 right. years right. and I'm out and he's still stuck in it, especially if it was bad, mm -hmm. Adam has to either get out or cut ties with me. Mm -hmm. That's it. Like, cause I am a constant reminder of the fact that he's too scared to get out. Sure. Right. Or I am just, I'm just not like, I'm not conducive with that lifestyle anymore. So a lot of your veteran friends, they're just going to drop off the face of the planet when you get out. Mm. They're not doing it on purpose. You're going to feel like you should be mad at them. This is just part of the psychology of separation. Yeah. Right. Like it sucks. Yeah. And this happens in corporations too. It's just like, but that's why spending time with each other outside of military related events is mm -hmm. the most important part of creating a foundational relationship that will last after the military. Very, very well said. I think, you know, that those are really important points for, for people to hear. And I really do believe these are, these are things that, you know, vet it takes a long time for veterans to realize. Um, so it hurts. Um, yeah. It, it hurts. hurts. Mm -hmm. So like, Chris and I are still tight, but there was a long period where we didn't really communicate. We sure. still communicated more than almost any of my other peers in the military. But fundamental to that is we had spent a lot of time at my first duty station and in training together. Mm -hmm. We went out, we went, we went like boating and fishing and did things that were not military related together. And yeah. that created a bond that was not just fixated on what we did as our jobs yeah very um, well said yeah and and like that's why you need to take time not burn both ends of the candle spend it with your family spend it with the people that you meet that are worth investing in for the long term because yeah. long-term relationships are really how the whole rest of your life is going to flesh out. Yeah, very well said. You know, two the two kind of principal takeaways I heard from you is uh, one is your your expectations, right? Uh, don't believe that you're about to enter some different universe when you finish military yeah. service. And then You'll the second, think you are. right? And then the second is to you know start creating you know a, a network, a community, whatever kind of word you want to use there. You know, family connections, friend connections. Uh, you know, so that when you do leave the military, you're not leaving in all of a sudden, you know, plopped into uh, aloneness, essentially, right? You have, yeah. have people to rely on, people who rely on you, uh, right? So that goes both ways. Uh, yeah. Very, very really, well said, really Joe. Yeah, thank you. So, um, you know, well, let's let's jump back forward now uh, okay. into into your career. Uh, we talked about various software jobs. Um, talked in the AC space in terms of technology, right? With my paint buckets. Yeah. Okay. So basically I transitioned my, um, robotics company mm -hmm. to focus on software after I had worked in the software field for long enough. Mm -hmm. And to, to the point that we were just making about connections, I, one of the best decisions I made before getting out of the military was the people that I thought would be good to stay connected with. I connected with them all on LinkedIn. And I, so everyone I could convince to make a LinkedIn account while they were in the military, because that was still like a baby tool, but I, right. I knew it was going places. So I probably should have invested in stock. Then I would have a totally <laughs> different story. Um, <laughs> but basically I was connected with Chris. I had been running uh, my software company and my software company uh, Daypalm Media really focuses on process automation. One of the mm. things that I learned in the military and from, from follow on is I have a, a hyper logical mind. I like to do physical things mm -hmm. and I like, I understand processes really well. So you can bring me to your factory or you can bring me to your job site. And, mm. and I really like to learn a new thing. And that's, that's where all the hobbies on the back kind mm -hmm. of come and play, right? Like awesome. I like to learn new things. I like to play with things. I like to explore different ways of solving problems and to perfect them, mm -hmm. right? So I had developed some, you know, plastics manufacturing software, uh, meeting software and other things. And there was, there was a little bit of room for another project. 
I posted on LinkedIn that I was looking for projects and Chris just happened to open LinkedIn mm -hmm. and see that his buddy Joe had made a post and he looked and he's like, shit, I need software really bad. <laughs> right. Cause if you go back to the other episode, I'm sure he talked about how he went in and was trying to solve all these problems the same way he did when I was in the military with him in Excel and, and basically like that was the way a lot of problems would solve. And then I, even in the military back then would take his Excel spreadsheet and I would turn it into a real database. Awesome. That's just kind of like all, always like all the way back to then how our relationship had worked. He saw that I had a software company when I made that post, he didn't mm. even realize it. And then we went and did like a little MVP together that took a couple months and we've been working on it ever since. Fundamentally, the, the fact that he's in the field, has domain expertise mm -hmm. in new residential paint and, and we have, you know, at this point, thousands of projects that we were able to manage yeah. and lots of people as well. It's, it was the ideal situation for me to take my expertise and say, all right, you tell me every step of the process that the new construction paint goes through mm -hmm. and basically painfully teach me how to be a painter from the back office perspective. And I was then able to work with him and my team to, in, instead of creating software that focused on a general approach, what I've done is created a super niche way of solving problems that are very specific to mm -hmm. that group of people. Because I believe in, if a company is successful to the point where they are struggling because they have too many orders, not right. because they don't have enough, they have a good process. Mm -hmm. And most companies in this position basically get to the point where their real issue is they have a good process that does not scale. Mm -hmm. Right. And I don't think that software for, should force people to do things differently. Right. If that makes sense. Definitely software does. software should be there to help them do the same thing better. Mm -hmm. And and that is where the last what five years of my life with Chris has been focused on basically taking small problems that are faced in the field and and honing in on how do we basically say this is what you need to deliver or this mm -hmm. is what needs to happen in the field. What are the steps that need to happen in the background to make sure that that is a successful operation? What do we need to track to make sure that you have evidence in the future so that you get paid for the job? What kind of things do we need to tell the people in the field who are actually painting? What does the back office need to know? And how can we reduce the amount of interaction that's needed for each of those steps so that it feels seamless, right? Yeah. You know, as you're describing that, first of all, I think all of that tracks in a very understandable and relatable way for anyone in, you know, anything construction trade related. Um, so it, that's really cool. Second is I just want to say I really appreciated your the way that you described that in your thought process that you applied to the, the problem essentially, right, that you're solving for, that you've solved for um, in the sense of, you know, process management, operations management. In the sense that software is there to help you do what you're doing better, simpler, faster, more efficiently. Um, really neat. Really neat. So, yeah. wh where are you? Where are you guys now on on the software side of things? Like, what what are you looking at in terms of? Uh, I'll call it near future and future future. Yeah. So basically, at this point, we really had honed in on the way that the market works for the main contractor and the subcontractors. Mm -hmm. And we're actually at the point where we're starting to provide features that it interface with and help problems with the builder side and mm. the vendor side as well, which is really big. Yeah. Fundamentally, we're, we're trying to help bridge a lot of that gap. One thing that you'll find in the construction industry is most people are hyper, hyper technology resistant. Mm -hmm. um, 
And and it's usually for good reason because at the end of the day, they just know what they need to do. They're going to go into the field. A lot of the people that you're going to have on this show that specifically go and build things themselves. I've, mm-hmm. I've built houses, but mostly for myself or for volunteer type things. And it's just a different mindset when you're there. And the more the more distractions you have, the less work you're getting done. Mm-hmm. Unless it's unless it's listening to a podcast. <laughs> Here's your place for plug. Exactly. Uh, but fundamentally, when you're putting up drywall, you're putting up drywall. Anything else is in the way. Right. Everything is about getting those steps done for the person in the field. Mm-hmm. Then you have the next level up, which is dealing with planning, getting everything lined up, making sure the materials are there at the right time, yeah. and making sure that you get the right people to the job site. And then up above that step, you have up to the point where you're trying to actually get approval on doing these steps Mm -hmm. from municipalities. The worst part, in my opinion, of the whole process. Agreed. It's absolutely, it's why I'm here in Indiana. (laughs) Basically, I spent two and a half years waiting to get permits, finally got permits. And, and then that's when things went south and I I will not go down that rabbit hole, but it is a bad (laughs) rabbit hole. Um, I think, and so I think a lot of uh, our listeners and other people that are going to be joining the show could all, could all relate, right? Everyone here is in built environment. Yes. Permit process is brutal always. Yeah. Yeah. So functionally though, Mm -hmm. the main part that we're focusing on with my paint buckets is that part in the middle and the bottom like we're not we're not dealing with the very bottom we're not telling you how to put paint on the wall we're not telling you where where the tape goes or any of that that's that's domain expertise Mm -hmm. and it would be be beyond asinine for me to expect you to put like an ar headset on and be like okay cool now here's where all the paint goes Agreed. Right? Agreed. Like, just let's calm down. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and like, there's cool things that you can do. Like I've seen people with the AR and AI piece where it, it helps you to make sure you swept everything, right. etc. cetera. That, we've all seen that. It's pretty neat, but there's a risk in over introducing technology into these areas to the point where it actually makes things less efficient. Yeah, and, and that is not at all what we want, right? We just want to simplify processes, make sure everyone's on the same page, manage the, the more complicated and the, and the bigger your operation, the more you have to manage. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's really, it's in your best interest to have a specific way that you handle that process. And a lot of people just basically guess or write it down on a notepad. Yeah. Yeah. Or do it in Excel. Right. Right. And that's like when you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars, that's really dangerous. Right. Like it's a problem. I've heard I've heard horror stories about people ordering like an extra hundred gallons of paint. What are you going to do with an extra hundred gallons of paint? Right. Like that's that is that is a big pain. And you can't put that on your builder. Right. That's on you. Like you're the one who ordered an extra hundred gallons of paint of a particular color. And I hope you have another project down the street you can bid on Yeah. because like there is an expiration date on paint. Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) And so it's, it's a logistical nightmare. Right. If you are not paying attention to these detailed pieces, but it's also sitting and having to have multiple jobs just to pay attention to those pieces takes away from what you can do in the field. Right. So you, you know, it's your point, especially as scale happens, right? And operations grows, you know, with yeah. scale, you know, it's all of the admin processes that could have efficiency implemented against them to simplify everything and allow you to, you know, focus on other things that maybe software is not going to hit. So a hundred percent agree with you. Um, and, you know, maybe there is like the, uh, near or even distant future where AI hardware per se is going to have an effect. But I a hundred percent agree with you where today it's, you know, really looking at the, like I just said, that admin back office, uh, process management that has so yeah. much room to improve on, um, and really can have a significant impact on the way people do business and, uh, you know, just revenues, right. Growth of business accordingly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, like fundamentally for me, 
the reason I love working on the project and the reason I am still passionate about it after mm -hmm. all these years is it's making people's lives better yeah. at work. Right. So like as someone, you've heard my story, I've had a lot of interesting and unpleasant experiences in my work life mm. and being able to do software that I know isn't just going to get ice boxed yeah. is one big thing. Right. Cause I, I worked for, I think what four companies, not including the military, where every line of code that I made for them was just put on a server somewhere yeah. and iced right. when they were acquired. Mm -hmm. And and for sure the the military, I I developed code for free for them, and they chose to not implement it. And now mm -hmm. they're working on implementing something similar. Right? It's. It's something that kept on happening in my life where I would create something beautiful. Everyone would be like, well, that's really cool. But it wasn't ever marketed and sold or it was to a very limited extent. And I think like that is something that's tremendously satisfying about construction, right? right? At the end of the day, like I, I haven't built other people's houses generally outside of volunteer work, but I have built houses for myself mm -hmm. and there's just nothing like inviting your friends over to a cookout outside of a little place that you built by hand with your little boy. Yeah. Agreed. Like, like standing on a deck that you made yourself mm -hmm. is just satisfying. Be like, look, it didn't even fall. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> right. Like it's just, I, I only think that people who've actually made something big enough for people to go into can actually describe the experience of what it's like to invite someone into something you built. Yeah. If that makes sense. It's right. Like you can, you can Read. imagine it, but yeah, it's, that's, so, that's just something about the field that is really satisfying because yeah. you're creating something real. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So let's, um, very well said, and I totally agree with you. Uh, it's the tangible uh, outcome that is just very satisfying and rewarding uh, for sure. Yeah. So let's touch on, um, you know, I know we've, you know, really touched on this uh, a bunch of times through, through your story. Uh, but I want to give the opportunity to really like highlight the translatable skills that I don't know, maybe top few that come to mind military to profession, uh, right now. Yeah. I think patience mm. is big, right? But don't let it get abused right? Mm -hmm. You're going to be more patient than you should be. And it's an asset, but it's also a liability. So, and it's going to take a while for you to learn that balance mm -hmm. because your initial reaction, of course, with me saying it's a liability might be to rail a little bit too hard in the other direction and then get fired. You don't need to go that far. It's really just about setting clear boundaries. Something that you'll have experienced in the military is you don't have boundaries outside of the ones that are legally enforced. In the civilian sector, you can have your own boundaries that you made up yourself. They may be able to fire you for them, but you can still have them and you won't go to Leavenworth. Mm -hmm. So that's... Like that is really important for your mental health to just at least know you can. It doesn't mean you have to just knowing that you can and you won't go to military prison for it mm -hmm. is a huge sigh of relief. The other thing is that your work life balance is still important, right? Mm -hmm. Like you still have to do that. No one's going to do that for you. If you're willing to be there for 16 hours and they don't get in trouble for it, that's how long you're going to be at work. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you're one of those people who's already good at work-life balance, then great. This should be easy for you. If you're not, you're going to have to still be working on those relationships with your family. You're still going to have to yeah. be working on your other pieces. And, and the, uh, the skills that really came out from the military and have still helped are like, they're going to teach you how to plan. Mm -hmm. And to schedule yourself and to be a lot more rigorous about what and when you're doing things. Mm -hmm. Those are extremely valuable in almost all fields, but particularly yeah. in heavily schedule driven fields. Mm -hmm. And your, your ability and, and tendency to show up early and leave a little bit late, those are really good traits a willingness to jump in and do actual physical work 
or to do things that are outside of your comfort, right? Something you'll notice in the civilian sector is it's a lot more common for someone to say, that's not my job. Mm -hmm. That's a pain in the ass. Don't like I, there's boundary setting, but when someone says they need help and it's not something that is in your job description, but you can do it. I've never seen it be a bad thing for you to still help. Yeah. Right. Like, I've got friends who are like, well, they're not paying me more, so I shouldn't do it. I'm like, but they're still paying you and you don't have any more work to do right now. Mm -hmm. Right. So what they're trying to do. And as someone who's been a boss for a really long time, when I ask you if you can do something else, I'm worried about letting you go. I like you. You're a good worker. I don't have that work right now. And either you're not getting paid the hourly or you might get let go altogether. So understand that that is, it's really a good approach to be open-minded about Mm -hmm. trying new things. And most people in the military I've noticed like will willingly go and do guard duty or explore a different thing because they had to, Mm -hmm. not because they wanted to, but you had to in the military. And that's not a bad policy to carry with you as long as you are still staying within what you're comfortable with. Yeah. Right. If that makes sense. It absolutely makes uh, sense. Yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of these things are, as you put it right, principles that really help in any field, but then especially so on a, on a schedule driven field, which is really everything yeah. related to built environment, schedule intensive. Exactly. Um, yeah. Very, very well said. All of that track and absolutely made sense. Yeah. Um, so, you know, before we uh, close out on the business side of the conversation, I want to give you uh, a plug opportunity to, uh, you know, mention any, any career wins that, that you want to uh, just plug in here mention be proud of well i mean like i'm really proud of the software that i've developed with date palm media and mm-hmm. that and one of those is the my paint buckets software that we've talked about i think mm-hmm. for me getting to the point where i can comfortably lead medium-sized teams and give them more flexibility to have a work-life balance than i was ever given myself is something i'm really proud of Right. It does yeah. limit my personal scale because I'm not willing to put my employees in positions where they are being abused, which puts me in a minority among my peers, I guess. But but like I'm really proud that I am able to keep a business running and treat the people that work for me well whenever yeah. possible. It doesn't mean that I don't get grumpy, et cetera, et cetera. But like it is really nice to have learned a little bit more work-life balance myself and to be able to share that with the people that work with me. Yeah. So that's encouraging that's a- someone, even like my business partners to be like, no, like I've got the reins. You take care of your doctor's appointment. You take mm-hmm. care of your kid. Right. Like that's important. It's an accomplishment and, and congratulations for that. Um, yeah. But that's amazing. Both uh, on the creation side and also on the, building and leading a team side. Um, Well said. So as we close out our conversation, we'd like to touch on two last things in which please answer at least one of them, right? We got wellness practice and or books that you'd like to recommend. Okay. So wellness practice, I've talked a little bit about, right? The work-life balance is a big Mm -hmm. thing. I recommend getting out. Um, Mm -hmm. I recommend getting out and turning your phone off. That Mm -hmm. is the most important wellness practice I can recommend. (laughs) That's a good one. Is go let your let your wife know, let your let your boss know. He doesn't even have to be really true. Just I'm going into the woods. There's no phone reception. Mm -hmm. Turn off the phone for at least 24 hours, and your life will be changed. Do that every couple of weeks. It doesn't matter what you do, but spend time disconnected so you can connect with yourself, and then. There's there's a lot of good books out there. I think that for me, one of the ones that I remember a little bit better for my transition period out of mm-hmm. the military was Influence, Science and Practice. I take things a little bit literal. So for me going into the real world, I absorbed a lot of audiobooks on running businesses how influence and leadership works and on basically psychology so that I could understand how normal people think, how to interact 
and how to be a better leader, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, the whole story of my, my military career was me wanting to contribute in technology, but also me wanting to become a better leader. Mm -hmm. And I found I got in a lot of cases, more value out of some of these books that I read. And by read, I, I mean, listen to because mm -hmm. I too busy. Uh, but basically having that along with some occasional college courses, uh, even if you're not doing a degree, like jumping in and taking a psychology class throws you in with a bunch of people who are in different positions in life. You get to hear what they're going through and experiencing. Mm -hmm. And one other alternative for the disconnect, like if you can't or don't like going camping and stuff, there's usually like meditation groups mm -hmm. where you just sit silently and you got to have your phone off mm -hmm. that can work as like a, an introduction to it. But I think just like going outdoors yeah. and turning off the phone is solid. Yeah. Lo love that. And you know, for, for everyone listening, recognize you have a technology person saying that. So anyone else has no excuse. I think particularly being hyper, hyper technology oriented, like, I mean, I got like two VR headsets around me because I'm developing a VR app mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they, all of these things are a mix of technology and mm -hmm. non-technology. Well, it's still technology, but you know, like the, the electronic and non-electronic things, but it becomes really apparent how much of your energy is put yeah. into constantly being on call, constantly being connected and always expected to be like, okay, cool. I got a LinkedIn message from Adam. I got to respond. And like, you got a LinkedIn message from me and you had to be on it. Right. Yeah. And we're, we're sitting like, it takes a lot of time. You, you probably mm -hmm. spend a couple of hours before this, just kind of getting ready. Right. So disconnecting is, it helps you see where your priorities are. It helps you feel yourself right like sometimes mm -hmm. you won't even know something's wrong with your body until you sit and experience just being and you'll be mm -hmm. like wow that didn't hurt before right that's kind of important yeah. right that's your life um and you can't build shit if you're dead so <laughs> don't forget that yeah well, I mean, <laughs> seriously really well said and and you know that resonates with me deeply. I have no doubt it'll resonate and connect with a lot of other people, our listeners. Joe, thanks so much, man, for sharing your story, for taking the time to be on the show. Uh, I have no doubt that you know your, your takeaways, your, your life experience is going to connect with other veterans. Thanks so much, man. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. To so our subscribers, thank you to, for subscribing. To our listeners, a reminder to please subscribe, like, and follow our channels on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. Uh, quick shout out to our channel sponsor, Jet. Thanks so much, everyone, for listening. Joe, best of luck, man. I'll be in touch. Thank you to our channel sponsors, Jet Build. If you're looking for ways to better manage your real estate development and construction projects, look no further. Jet is the command center software for end to end real estate development and construction management. That's www.jet.build.